As we look down upon Wellington's capital city, it becomes increasingly apparent just how much of the city is close to the sea. This is a problem because thanks to climate change and also the city's tectonics, sea levels are rising, and they're rising particularly fast here in Wellington compared to most of the rest of the country. However, the story is a lot more complicated than it might initially appear, because due to the tectonic situation, the land is both subsiding and also be periodically uplifted in a series of uh, slow vertical land movement events. And it's quite difficult from the GPS data over the past 20 years to determine what the overall long-term trend is, and from that, how these processes are likely to continue in the future and how they're going to affect sea level. We really need to understand these if we're going to work out what the future is for all the uh, businesses and people who live in the lowlands near the sea down there. So how then do we go about understanding the long-term trends in the movements of the land and the sea around the city? I'm going to take you on a geological journey to discover the methods by which we do this. So here we are inland in the uppermost part of Pawatahanui Salt Marsh. We can see the, the sea all the way down there, about 300 meters away. And where we are now, we have vegetation very much indicative of a sort of mid to uppermost salt marsh environment. You can see this sort of grass-like plant here, which is called oioi, which uh, likes to grow in sort of damp environments that are occasionally flooded. Um, we can also see the first sort of appearance of a variety of shrubs all around us, which uh, are quite salt tolerant species, um, as well as, uh, as flax, which uh, also likes to live in high marsh environments. You don't get that any, uh, any closer to the sea than this. So the vegetation is telling us that we're in the right environment for looking at the past sea level. And how do we do that? First, we take sediment cores. Now, the secrets lie in the ground beneath us. These muds underneath our feet are formed by the plants which like to grow in this environment. As they decay and rot down, they become the mud. But they're also, but sediment here is also supplied by the sea, which brings in sand particles and clay particles, as well as the wind. And all of these processes lead to sediment accumulation over time. And as the sediments accumulate, they give us a picture of the past. To take that picture, we need to drive a cora into the ground. And behold, the picture is taken. And it's not coming out. The <laughs> <laughs> that I felt like <laughs> Now, when we look at this core, we can see a quite clear, like, stratigraphic transition. We can see it's peaty. Below where it's peaty, it's sort of clayey, but has lots of organic material in it. And below that, we suddenly see lots and lots of little bits of shell, which are a lot like the same, well, a lot of them are actually the same species of bivalves, um, it's basically clams and cockles, that we see in the tidal flat. So effectively the beach all the way um, over there where we were filming earlier. And this indicates that we've gone from a beach into a salt marsh. But here's the thing, how do we know how rapid this was, and how do we know um, much about how this transition took place? We can look at this, and we can infer that this happened in an earthquake's uplift that effectively took this flat area of land from the tidal zone into an area where it could be colonized by these plants. But how do we actually know that this happened as a result of an earthquake? And how do we actually quantify the amount of sea level rise that's happened since this event 
we can sort of infer based on the number of centimetres of sedimentation since then, how much sea level has risen. But in order to really know, we need to zoom in into the, ma into the macro and examine the microverse and see what that tells us. Whilst we're at the salt marsh, we can use the relationship between elevation and a particular group of microbes called forams, which have a very close relationship between elevation and species, to reconstruct sea level. How do we go about doing this, I hear you ask? Well, what we do is we go to the top of the salt marsh, or as high as we can get, and we take surface samples in little sample pots. Um, and we take these every time we measure an elevation change more than about two centimeters. Uh, this way we get a very complete look at the microbial assemblage going from the top of the salt marsh down all the way to the bottom of the tidal flat. Now, once we've got this assemblage, what do we do with it? Well, I wash my samples to between 563 microns and then pick them, by which I mean we take the shells of these uh, forams, as they're known as, and count the number of each species. Um, and we then have this nice little plot of different species and the elevations that they prefer. And we can apply statistical models called transfer functions to these, which can define this relationship. And we can use them in the sediment cores that we take in the marsh to determine a very, very good uh, statistical, uh, statistically sound um, sea level reconstruction in the past. Sea level reconstructions in New Zealand are particularly important because not only are we facing uh, upwards of around three millimeters per year of sea level rise, but on top of that, what we're seeing is uh, some significant uncertainties regarding vertical land movement, which is occurring as a result of our complex tectonic regimes associated with the fact that we are sat astride a plate boundary. Um, here in Wellington, for example, we generally see about three millimeters per year of uh, subsidence going on but because of these, uh, these very gradual earthquake-like events called slow slip events, that is generally decreased to about 2.2 millimeters per year, which is interesting. That's what we see in the roughly 20 year long uh, GPS record. But then when we look at the long-term tide gauge record, uh, going back like so sort of the 1940s and older than the 1940s, but there was technically a different tide gauge before the 1940s. So we're just counting after the 1940s because there's a bit of a discrepancy there. Uh, we see about 1.4 millimeters per year of sea level rise in Wellington, which is considerably less than you'd expect there to be just from subsidence alone. So that would seem to indicate that there was more uplift than subsidence. So this whole situation is very complicated. And because of that, it's very uncertain as to what we actually should be expecting to see from the land and how that's going to affect the sea level or the relative sea level, as it were, the sea level in the city and around the area in the future. So these reconstructions are very, very important because they give us a, uh, an idea of what the long-term trend in vertical land movement actually is. So is it on average going down with interruptions that go up or is it on average going up with interruptions that go down? This is very important for people who are planning and dealing with uh, sea level rise and its impacts, people who are planning for like building developments and also for people who live near the coast who need to know how to manage uh, these, sorry, how to manage the effects of this in the future. So here we are at the very edge of Power Tahanui salt marsh, right where the sea meets the vegetation. And this is uh, a long marsh living uh, brush called Junkus.
and we can see something very, very striking here, which is that we go from a quite sort of high elevation, and then very, very abruptly, we have this drop-off. Now, what is causing this drop-off? Now, we actually see drop-offs like this at pretty much all New Zealand marshes. Um, one of my other study sites, Aramoana, is a notable exception to this. But why do we get this? We get this because when, because a large portion of the sediment that's brought up to this low marsh environment gets here from waves, effectively. But when sea level rise occurs faster than the rate at which sediment can be supplied to this environment, it's effectively in disequilibrium and it leads to erosion by the sea where more material is being stripped away than is being added on. And because of this, the marsh at this end is gradually being reclaimed by the sea, whilst at the other end, the ground becomes more saline. So in effect, the marsh gradually migrates inland as the sea level rises. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments and feel free to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Do note that a lot of this work is obviously in progress, so I'm not going to show you any of our conclusions or any of our deck proper data. In fact, I only showed you some of some of the data that went into some of what we're doing. Um, there's a lot that is nearly ready to be published, and a lot that is nowhere near ready to be published. So there's a lot of exciting stuff. If you are interested in how our sea level research is going, feel free to follow the NZ Sea Rise project on Twitter or on their website. There'll be links for that down below. If you are interested in geology, geophysics, uh, paleontology, micropaleontology, microbiology, or biology, feel free to follow this channel. Channel. I'll have a lot more, more sort of informative videos coming up in the near future. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a very nice day.